ಸಭೆಗಳ ನಮಸ್ತೆ ನಾವು ವಿ ಆರ್ ಗೋಯಿಂಗ್ ಟು ಕಂಡಕ್ಟ್ ವೈಬಿನಾರ್ ಹಂಡ್ರೆಡ್ ಪರ್ಸೆಂಟ್ ರಿನ್ಯೂಬಲ್ ಎನರ್ಜಿ ಸಪ್ಲೈ ರಿನ್ಯೂಬಲ್ ಎನರ್ಜಿ ಟೆಕ್ನಾಲಜಿ ಸೋಲಾರ್ ಬಯೋಮಾಸ್ ವಿನ್ ಆಸ್ಟ್ ಪೊಟೆನ್ಶಿಯಲ್ ಪ್ರೊಡ್ಯೂಸ್ ಡಿಪೆಂಡ್ಸ್ ಆನ್ ಫೋಸಿಲ್ ಫ್ಯೂಲ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಕ್ಲೀನ್ಔಟ್ ಗ್ಯಾಸ್ ಸಿವಿಸನ್ಸ್ ಹೌದು ಸೋಲಾರ್ ಅಂಡ್ ವಿನ್ ಎನರ್ಜಿ ಹ್ಯಾಬ್ variable and uncertain generation potential to integrate uh, uh, fluctuating renewable energy uh, into the national grid uh, off grid system uh, smart grid or uh, uh, energy storage technologies are essentials large scale storage uh, uh, provide grid stability and a fundamental required requirement for the reliable energy systems and uh, energy balancing to match the demand and the supply whereas small scale uh, storage is equally important for small uh, off grid electric system uh, for the transportation of the sector uh, to determine the potential role of storage in the grid off grid and transport in, it is important to evaluate the technical economical and social impact as well as the sustainability of the system uh besides it is also important to evaluate the techno economic of uh, variety of potentiality uh, competing technologies it is expected that the webinar on 100% renewable energy supply will help understand uh, the need of uh, energy storage to enable renewable energy integration uh, along with the technical economic and sustainability of aspect while using right system in our technology today uh, uh, working with uh, alternative energy promotion center and kathmandu university renewable energy confederation of nepal recon has been uh, able to organize the webinar to discuss and uh, share the knowledge on 100% renewable energy honorable member of national planning commission dr krishna prasad oli former minister and coordinator of uh, advisor committee of frequency uh, engineer ganesh saha professor andrew blackers and other distinguished speakers and experts will highlight on the subject uh, in the matter of uh, global contest in the contest and national contest uh, in the in this uh, webinar uh how will the how will the solar uh, pv uh, thermal uh, biomass bi- wind are also the renewable energy source of energy available in nepal whereas fossil fuel are not available in uh, nepal and all the required fossil fuel are imported from foreign country its importance of renewable energy technology is very important in nepal's perspective so is the uh, consideration of the environment climate change health economic uh, employment creation uh, which have vital relationship with the renewable energy technology uh, so may rates may be the different from a from point of view of uh, investment uh, but it solve many problem of uh, all uh, work into life so uh, hydro power is the main source of renewable energy in nepal uh, the first uh, uh, in nepal 500 kilowatt hydro power is established before 119 years and uh, today around 1400 megawatt electricity has been generated by the government entity and independent power private uh, power producer solar pv technology is another resource have been installed however the ratio of hydro power uh, is actively uh, encouraging this is the most uh, main source of uh, energy in nepal the solar pv pumping system for drinking water and solar pumping for system for the irrigation installed has been high impact uh, the uh, and similarly electricity for lighting and other 
professional use of institutional scale by solar PV system, uh, which is a really little bit success. And solar mini grid uh, have been introduced for optimal benefit of the uh, life. And rooftop solar net metering also is in progress. And micro hydro is the best practice in Nepal, which has been successfully implemented and have very reputed in, uh, uh, I think, around uh, 10,200 pico and micro hydro plant have been installed. And wind power is also introduced in small, even in small scale and getting progress in the recent years. Some micro hydro plant have been successfully connected to the national grid, biogas plant uh, and domestic size of the uh, 4,000 cubic meter are also successful in uh, Nepal. Biomass energy is another contributing energy in Nepal. The forest resources are also used in domestic uh, needs and improved food store, more than 1.5 million number have been installed so far. The expert and entrepreneurs are looking for the different uh, support from the government, non-government agency and financial institution for the best use of the biomass renewable energy. Uh, by adopting planet making and recruit uh, modern technology, <laughs> Nepal is going to be So, I think this, uh, this program is very suitable and uh, we need to uh, Hello, Sunil sir. Sunil sir, are you there? Sunil sir. Sunil sir. Sunil sir. Azur. Uh, Gunda sir, ko, um, welcome remarks. Uh, I would like to request to conduct uh, the program. Uh, yes. Uh, sir, I have a panel with Subot sir. I have a panel with you. Thank you. Mraj ji? Yeah. I will do, sir. Okay. Okay, I will start now. Uh, first of all, good morning and namaste to all. I am Sunil Loni, Associate Professor uh, at Kathmandu University. Uh, I will be moderating the program, uh, today's program. Um, so uh, I will be with you uh, the next one and a half hour, uh, more or less. So uh, before starting the program, I would like to uh, thank everyone, uh, or I, I would say I'm pleased that we have gracious presence of distinguished guest speakers and participants. We have an uh, honorable member of National Planning Commission who will be joining soon, Dr. K.P. Wally, uh, Registrar of Kathmandu University, Professor Subodh Sarma, former Minister of Science and Technology, Mr. Ganesh Saha, uh, our renowned science, solar scientist, Professor Andrew Blackers, and many other prominent figures. So I would like to welcome you all to the program. So uh, before starting the program, uh, allow me to give a brief overview of the program, uh, or brief overview of the seminar, 100% renewable energy or renewable supply. So as we know, almost uh, actually Guruji also uh, slightly discussed before, but uh, I would like to uh, briefly go through it. As we know, almost 68% traditional biomass, 25% commercial fuels, and 3.5% each electricity and uh, modern renewables contributed to the total energy consumption in Nepal. At the same time, Nepal have abundant so resources of solar energy, biomass, and some wind as well. So in this scenario, or this scenario, suggests so Nepal has huge potential to integrate modern renewables in national energy mixture. So I believe we all participant of the seminar, this seminar are renewable enthusiastic and point of the clean environment. We all know renewable, solar, modern biomass, wind 
have vast potential to produce clean energy and reduce greenhouse gas emission. However, especially solar wind have variable and uncertain generation potential. They might need large, small storage, smart grid, or combination of both systems. Thus, in today's seminar, we'll hear our experts on how to ensure 100% renewable supply from fluctuating renewable sources. So today, we'll have two keynote speeches, Dr. K.P. Oli, Honorable Member of National Planning Commission, and Professor Andrew Blackers from Australian National University. And we'll have five remarks or comments on the program, on the webinar, on the presentation made by the keynote speakers. Mr. Ganesha, former minister, Professor Jagannath Sreshto, Dr. Naren Chawlagai, Dr. Lakshman Jimire, and Mr. Naveen Bujayal. So at the end of the expert remarks, we'll open the floor for question and answer sessions. However, due to time constraints, it may not be possible for many of you to ask your question on your own. So I encourage you to put your questions or queries in the chat box, which will be taken care of. And now, uh, it's, uh, Mr. Gurunaz Dhakal already welcome to the participants. So I will directly go to the, our registrar, Professor Subodh Sarma. He is registrar at Kathmandu University. So I would like to request Professor Subodh Sarma to make your brief welcome remarks. The floor is yours, Professor Sarma. Thank you, uh, Dr. Sunil Lohani. Yeah, good morning from Nepal for Australia. It's not good morning, good day for Australia and good day for everyone. Uh, to Dr. Sunil Lohani, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. It's indeed a great pleasure seeing you all here this morning uh, with honorable member of National Planning Commission and definitely Professor Andrew. Uh, I believe we have met once, but I'm not sure. If your photograph is, wait, it's not your photograph. I see you smiling. So it's your light. Uh, and then uh, our uh, minister, previous minister of environment, Ganesh Sasser, who has always been a source of inspiration for us. And all speakers, all participants who are assembled here today, listening to 100% renewable supply. Uh, I would like to begin uh, with, uh, Quoting what Dr. Sunil Lohani just now said, Nepal has enormous potential for different kinds of renewable energies, whether it is hydropower or solar or wind power or biogas uh, because of its rich water resources. And then I believe nowhere, nowhere on earth one can find such a huge altitudinal variation uh, than in Nepal. So it's a wonderful place for any kind of uh, renewable energy research that one would like to undertake. Uh, but the dilemma here is uh, more than 78 to 80% of the people live in rural areas. And we, the researcher, are we reaching these rural areas or not? If you look at the renewable energy potentiality and then the way it has been uh, utilized in Nepal, if you go from east to west, say about 62% of uh, renewable energy potentiality uh, being captured in central development region. But if you move towards the western part of Nepal, it's only 3.08 percentage where there is most requirement and need is. So our research should always comply with uh, entrepreneurship, the renewable energy entrepreneurship, and we must always try to reach where there is a need. I was last year involved in a research in Jumla in a place called Mohirigaon, where we tried to look at the crop residues and then we tried to generate biogas there in the prevailing very cold temperature. If we can promote our research in those areas with very cold temperature, where there is huge need of biogas in order to replace the uh, fuels that they are using, that they derive from forest, in order to protect forest also, we have got to encourage biogas production there, and there is no dearth of any crop residue. So I would insist this webinar today and all the speakers to come up with a regulation whereby 
we could uh, attract our researcher going to all these remote places where there is a need and then uh, involve our researchers, not only in research, but also in entrepreneurship and bring a change so that people will feel that uh, the, the presence of researcher in those areas. So my good luck to every one of you. And then thanks once again, uh, Dr. Sunil Lohani, sir, for inviting me and giving this opportunity. It, it's a great pleasure having you all here this morning. Thank you so much. I hope I didn't speak too much. Namaste. Uh, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. You, you are quite uh, brief, actually, more than expected. So uh, as Professor Sarma said, we have different terrains in the country. So that means our researcher, our resources, and our entrepreneurs should reach to all the places to uh, uplift the livelihoods of the people living or residing in those areas as well. So I hope uh, we'll hear more on, on these aspects as well from our experts today. So now I would like to move on without any delay because we have uh, time constraint. So I would like to smoothly flow the program. Uh, I'm not sure whether our KP sir, I don't know what. Gurad sir. Yes, I'm trying, but uh, not success. So, so I yes, think uh, I'll, I'll start with Professor Andrew, right? Uh, because we have very limited time. So uh, I'll move on to our most uh, awaiting keynote speaker, who is a renowned solar scientist, uh, Professor Andrew Blackers. Professor Blackers is E2 professor of engineering at the Australian National University. He was founder of the Solar PV Research Group at ANU. In 1980s and 1990s, his lab achieved all record efficiencies of silicon solar cell. He was co-inventor of the PRC silicon solar cell, which has 70% of the global solar market. Uh, Professor Blakers, these days, engaged in analysis of energy systems with 50 to 100 percent penetration by PV and wind with support from pump hydroelectric storage. Uh, I request Professor Blaker uh, to limit your speech within 20, 25 minutes. Now the floor is yours, Professor Blakers. Thank you. So I will share my screen. Um, but I think, there we are. Have I successfully shared the screen? Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to talk about moving to 100% renewables with a focus on Australia and Nepal. But I start with a global snapshot. Uh, the silicon solar cell is the runaway winner of the energy race. It has easily beaten every other form of energy generation. So you can see in this graph for 2019, um, solar and wind together are about two thirds of net new global capacity additions, um, far exceeding oil, gas, coal, nuclear, hydro, bioenergy, geothermal, solar thermal, ocean, and everything else put together. So the focus everywhere basically has to be on solar PV and wind because they are cheap. In my own country of Australia, we are installing wind and solar very fast, faster than anybody else in the world by a large margin. So we are installing something like uh, 240 watts of new wind and solar per person per year. And it'll have be the same again this year. So for three years in a row, we have been around that level of installation. It's four to five times faster per capita than Japan or the USA or Europe or China, and 10 times faster than the global average. So we know a thing or two in Australia about how to install wind and solar fast. And we also know how much it costs. So as we move towards 30, 40, 50% solar and wind, then we need to worry about grid stability. 
having wind and solar together is very good because often the wind blows at night and the sun never shines at night. Spreading your solar and wind collectors over a big area, all of Nepal or all of Nepal plus all of India and interconnecting hugely reduces the amount of storage by smoothing out the local weather. So if it's windy and sunny in one place and no wind and no sun somewhere else, you can move energy from one place to another. And the amount of storage you need goes down by a factor of five <laughs> or 10 if you can spread your solar collectors and wind collectors out widely. Of course, you need to manage demand and try and have as many loads in the middle of the day as possible. And you need some storage and pumped hydro and batteries are the two by far leading contenders. So India and Nepal together uh, and Bhutan and um, the other small states um, are quite a large area, a million, the million square kilometers or so. And it just so happens that the current state-of-the-art range for high voltage DC transmission is 3000 kilometers at 1.1 million volts, carrying 12 gigawatts, which is twice Nepal's, or three times Nepal's current installed capacity with only a 10% loss. So you can connect Northwest India with the bottom of Sri Lanka and everywhere in between using current technology to smooth out the solar and wind resource across the entire subcontinent. Looking at storage, um, pumped hydro is by far the largest amount of storage in terms of both storage energy and storage power because it's by far the cheapest. And Nepal has, of course, very large amounts of potential pumped hydro energy storage. Most energy storage at present in pumped hydro form is on river. So you can see an example here where you have two close reservoirs and the turbine can operate as a pump. So on a sunny and windy day, the water can be pumped uphill. And then in the middle of the night, the water comes back down through the turbines to recover that energy. But this is a very limited form of pumped hydro energy storage and has not much future, neither in Nepal nor anywhere in the world, compared with off-river pumped hydro. This is an example from Italy, two artificial reservoirs, one at the top of a hill, the other at the bottom with a height difference of 500 meters in between. And there's a tunnel connecting the two and the water is pumped backwards and forwards between the two reservoirs, pumping during the day when the sun is available and letting the water come back down through the turbines at night. And the area of the reservoirs is 10 or 50 times smaller than the area of a compar comparable river-based system. So we at the Australian National University did a global search for all of the off-river pumped hydro sites in the world. We excluded urban areas and all conservation areas. And we found 616,000 off-river sites with 23 million gigawatt hours, which is uh, about a hundred times more than you would need to run the entire world on um, wind and solar with the levels of electricity consumption found in Australia, which is among the highest in the world. So zooming in from this atlas, which is available online at the government website, you can see that no surprise, there's a lot of sites along the Himalayas, but there's also quite a few sites in Southern India and in Sri Lanka and Eastern India. Zooming into Nepal, you can see that Nepal has completely unlimited number of sites. Zooming into the Kathmandu Valley, you can see that uh, even in this little area, there's large numbers of sites. And all of this is described in great detail in our atlas. You can click on the tunnel routes or the reservoirs to get a lot of information about each one. And um, the upper reservoir is the uh, the light blue, the lower reservoir is the dark blue, and you can, um, and the tunnel route is the, is the line. So you can go to our atlas and look in your favorite area to see how much pump, off-river pumped hydro there is. 
the important thing is that the reservoir areas are small. So a lot of energy in a very small reservoir, which hugely limits the environmental consequences of damming Himalayan rivers. And this is a close-up detail um, of, a, of a site in India, 50 gigawatt hours. This is a big reservoir, um, uh, which would be a week of uh, Nepal's entire consumption. And you can see the upper reservoir, the lower reservoir, the dam wall and the tunnel route. And you can click on the reservoirs or the tunnel route and up comes a pop-up with lots of information. So I'd leave that you to play with that. Pumped hydro has important system benefits. It's mature. There's already 170 gigawatts installed around the world. Um, far more sites than we need to support a global 100% renewable electricity system. There's mechanical inertia because there's a heavy rotating generator, quick response and black start capability. So pumped hydro and batteries are matched very well together. Batteries are great for short term storage of minutes to hours and pumped hydro for overnight to a week or so. So now I'm going to focus on uh, Nepal energy options. So hydro is the obvious thing that springs to mind in Nepal. And this is a graph of the number of hydroelectric power yeah, watts per person. So Iceland and Norway are up the top, followed closely by Bhutan your close neighbour, and Canada, Switzerland, countries that you would expect. Uh, Nepal is down the right-hand end, um, very far down the list, so the watts per person in Nepal is really very low at present. And um, obviously people in Nepal and people in India think about increasing the number of hydroelectric systems. Wind power in Nepal is very limited, um, just over the border in um, the Tibet region, there's unlimited wind power, although not many people live there. Um, but most of the wind power in Nepal, of course, would be on the high peaks where it would be very difficult to operate wind turbines. There might be some prospects, but they're really not very good. However, solar in Nepal is quite good. Um, the redder, the better. Once again, over the border is um, extremely good. Um, but Nepal is and India are good by world standards. They're much better than Europe or North America or Northeast Asia. And because the latitude is quite low, they, the solar resource doesn't change too much from summer to winter. Now, there's a number of places you can put solar PV. One is on rooftops, of course, and that takes no land at all, um, but a very, interesting and very large scale future place to put solar photovoltaics is agrivoltaics. So these are panels on high frames on top of agricultural areas. And it turns out that you can cover a quarter or a third of the, the, the paddy or the crop and only lose about 10% of the food. So a farmer, will achieve two cash crops from the one piece of land, a small reduction in income from their food, but a, a big increase in income from leasing land to a company that owns the solar panels. And this is a very well established model in many countries. Nepal has unlimited land effectively to meet all of its energy needs now and in the far future. So I want to make an important point. Uh, Nepal's future is solar photovoltaics. It's not hydro, it's not biomass. These are small, small, small. Solar PV beats everything on costs already and will um, beat everything even better over the next 10 years. The costs are low, they keep coming down. You've got an enormous resource and it's completely sustainable. So at the moment, Nepal has a production of six terawatt hours per year. And um, given that the Nepalese solar resource is equivalent to about one and a half terawatt hours per gigawatt, that means that to supply all of Nepal's current production from solar, you need four gigawatts. 
and the area of panel required is 20 square kilometers, which turns out to be about 0.7 square meters per person, which is um, much smaller than their bed, is much smaller than the roof area. Nepal has completely adequate land to provide all of its electricity now and in the long-term future from solar PV. Now, I just want to put this in context. Australia and Nepal have very similar populations. Australia is installing three gigawatts of solar PV on rooftops every year. So every year, Australia installs nearly as much solar as Nepal needs for its entire current production. There is nothing hard about installing four or 40 or 400 gigawatts of solar PV in Nepal. Let's look to the future. At the moment, the current Nepal electricity production is about 0.2 megawatt hours per person per year. Singapore, um, the European Union, Australia, North America, all the developed countries are up around six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven 10, 11 megawatt hours per person. So I'll just choose Singapore, which is about in the middle. They have an electricity consumption of nine megawatt hours per year, per person. And as we get rid of coal, oil and gas, we need to electrify everything. That's electrify transport and heating and industry. And Singapore will need about 20 megawatt hours per person per year to completely drive oil, gas and coal out of its economy and get rid of almost all of its greenhouse gas emissions. There's no reason why Nepal should settle for anything less than 20 megawatt hours per person per year. Why should Nepal settle for being not as good as Singapore or Australia or any other country? And that means that the electricity demand per person will rise a hundred times over the next 30 or 40 years. And you'll need 20 to 50 square meters of solar PV panel per person to do this, which is still less than the roof area available. In other words, all of Australia, all of Nepal's electricity and also all of its other energy through electrification of transport, heating and um, industry, all of it, can be accommodated with no land alienated at all on building roofs. And the area of land from agrivoltics is also vastly more than required. In other words, Nepal can do the whole job sustainably at very low cost and falling cost with solar PV. And that's the way the world's going to go, even places like Nepal that have got a lot of hydro potential. The solar PV is cheap. In Nepal at the moment, you could do it at a reasonable scale for $50 US per megawatt hour. By 2030, that'll be down to $30 US per megawatt hour. It's hard to envisage hydro coming in under that price. So you've got a vastly larger resource than hydro or bio or anything else, vastly less land, 20 or 100 times less, and almost no environmental impact, quite unlike damming Himalayan rivers. So storage is required and the, um, the options are hydro, uh, pumped hydro and batteries. Hydrogen is by far too expensive to compete with those three. So looking at who's got the most pumped hydro, it's Japan to stabilize its nuclear reactors, Taiwan, South Korea, United States, and Australia will actually move into second spot in a few years time because of a large new pumped hydro system being constructed. So pumped hydro is where it's going for large scale storage. Batteries are where it's going for short term high power storage. The hydrogen cycle is just nuts. Um, you have a round trip efficiency of about 25%. That means you have, um, if you have a, a unit, 100 units of energy, by the time you've created hydrogen and then got back your energy, you've lost 75 units of that energy. Uh, I would strongly advise Nepal not to go down the hydrogen rabbit hole and get lost. Um, there's a potentially large market selling power and energy to India, but you, Nepal would be far better to sell power to India rather than energy. In other words, um, sell power for short periods 
during the uh, evening and morning peak periods at high prices, rather than selling low cost energy uh, for middle of the night and middle of the day when you're competing with solar. So in conclusion, um, solar PV is the, the, the long term large scale energy option for Nepal. Um, hydro and pumped hydro can easily balance variable solar in Nepal. There's so many possible sites. There's potential sales for hydro and pumped hydro balancing power to India. And the pumped hydro with 24 hour storage has far smaller reservoirs and environmental impact than damming Himalayan rivers. Off river pumped hydro is really the way to go to minimize the environmental impact and the social impact of flooding lots of land when you build big reservoirs on rivers. Thank you. Hello, Sunil sir. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Professor Blaker, for insightful presentation. Uh, I think uh, there might be some new dimension to many of uh, participants to think of renewable energy resources, uh, actually the modern renewable, because hydro is also sometimes we call it renewable. So let's say modern renewables, solar, wind, biomass, etc. So you emphasized solar energy has tremendous potential in Nepal, and it will certainly beat the cost uh, to other technologies. And that is uh, somehow, I think, uh, valid for Nepal as well. Probably the life cycle uh, uh, cost we have to consider, but at least uh, I think it is uh, comparable to hydro electricity at the moment as well. So, uh, thank you very much uh, for this wonderful uh, presentation. I think there will be a number of questions at the end of the uh, uh, session. So, I'll, I'll request you to. Uh, also, you can yourself look at the chat box if there are any questions and prepare for the for the uh, addressing those queries. And now I would like to move on. Gunaradji, keep this around one. Well, I So, uh, Still, uh, our keynote speaker is uh, not at joint, so he will soon join to the program. So I would like to move on to uh, our uh, uh, for the for the remarks um, on the on the presentation or overall renewable energy systems in Nepal, or maybe policy issues uh, of renewable energy. So I would like to request Mr. Ganesha, who is former Minister of Science and Technology and currently coordinating the RECON uh, Advisory Committee of RECON as well, for your uh, brief remarks. So the floor is yours, Mr. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sunil Loni, uh, dear participants of this program and uh, there is our uh, Dr. Subodh Sharma and other dignitaries and uh, Andrew from the Australia. So first of all, thank you very much Andrew for giving the insights about the renewable energy and about the potentiality of the renewable energy in Nepal. I will put just two, three remarks. First, you see, uh, uh, the consumption of electricity or here the when you call the energy, we we confuse with the electricity. You see, so here is a um, big dilemma. You see, that uh, when you say energy, it means electricity. So and that electricity means not for the other purposes only for the light. Might be one bulb, two bulb, so that you the light. 
so whole energy perceptions has to be shifted that energy is needed for the agriculture energy is needed for the industry so first is that why we need energy energy for the better life and other things so so first is the concept of the energy then the the clean energy so there are the different forms of the clean energy or we call it you see there is a lot of uh, world confused in nepal about this whether we call it the alternative energy we call it the renewable energy we call it the clean energy you see so there are we have a different um, perceptions about the understanding that's why you see in nepal there is a alternative energy promotion center it means it is a still a alternative it is not the main stream the renewable energy how you are going to make the renewable energy as a main stream of your energy is one of the basic challenge i feel in nepal one i told you as one is the how do you perceive the energy your as you see clean energy for the better life or energy consumption to us of the different countries how low you are because we don't use our energy in the say in the agriculture it's very very low we are very low on the industrialization even in the agriculture post harvesting other things so that has to be shifted from energy perception has to be shifted second is that renewable energy must be the main source of energy for that what they have shown about the potential of this all these pumps are very uh, listening attentively listening about the pumping scheme from up to down there is a lot of discussion about all these these things in nepal but unless you don't show a successful project it becomes very very you see suspicious in nepal especially when you talk about the machinery the people has a perception that we buy the machinery but we cannot run the machinery so when you even in the small pumping stations we have seen because i work on the pumps and other things so there has been a lot of uh, what you say voltage fluctuation motor burning you see no spare parts the other operation and maintenance problems that so there is a psychology that the machinery you should use less machinery in your system even in the water supply sanitation which is one of my favorite sector you see this you know it may be 16 km 20 km gravity pipeline they feel it is a reliable source because they put in the pump and pumping the water they say no this will break down it will you be month you have to pay so so the the, uh, the understanding of all things has to be also the cost effectiveness or its benefit has to be the economics of this has to be understood also now lastly as after subodh sir has uh, rightly pointed out that the what and where we should do the research that the energy poverty is one of the biggest poverty in the 21st century i, I say you see i sometimes i make this switch a, a little bit with the political perspectives also you see that when a country where we want to in our constitution going towards the socialism or the say or communism you see but how you are looking on the energy perspective is not very very clear here we say energy or electricity production it is only for the basically for the export purpose you see in nepal that is you see when you say you have the uh, every day now you see in our media that there is a great uh, loss of the electricity we are not can use the electricity so we have to build the transmission line and sell it to the india or to the bangladesh you see so the internal consumption how we are going to be that has, has to be addressed so i think largely we have to discuss on the policy matters second is the how we are going to invest in this sector third is the how our scientific and technical manpower need so these are the few challenges where we are still working and uh, as you know the recon the, the renewable energy confederation of nepal which was formed about officially those who are working formally four years before so in this last four five years we have been continuously advocating with the policy makers decision makers 
working with the our academia say kathmandu university our trivandrum university the ioe and over the world also so i think with your uh, support and help and cooperation we can do more in this sector so thank you very, very much for your uh, uh, especially you have already work out the a uh, little bit more on the nepal uh, scenario potentialities i think we have to discuss more concretely about might be concrete even the basin wise the places where it can be done what you have shown in the your pictures you see so in second thank you very much and thank you recon for giving me the opportunity to be the part of this program thank you namaste uh, thank you gorish sir thank you very much for your wonderful remarks so uh, you basically um, try to portray the condition of the country because we still have perhaps low technical knowledge among people so biomass and electricity consumption is like uh, as we know all six, more than 68% is biomass in our total energy mixture but people understood 3.5% is electricity uh, share but people understood energy means electricity so that you uh, rightly pointed out these things so still it is not a mainstream that's why we have alternative promotion energy promotion center you mentioned it so i think in 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 a not cell i think uh, perhaps that was the reason of our low capabilities uh, maybe investment financial capabilities our uh, human resources are not well uh, well trained and maybe we need to more investment on those areas as well and maybe we need more resource in development uh, activities in collaboration with our private sector uh, industrial i mean all industrial sectors government sectors and um, uh, those who already have uh, tremendous experience in research experience like professor andrew and all of, uh, other universities among all other universities in the world so uh, thank you very much uh, professor sorry uh, mr saha now we have a uh, uh, honorable member of uh, national planning commission dr kp oli has already joined so uh, namaste and welcome to namaste everybody dr oli sir thank you uh uh am i sunira sir sunira ya sir acha khud sun jo Intro, intro yes. Hello. So, uh, without any delay, uh, I request uh, our keynote speaker, Dr. K. P. Oli. Uh, he is honorable member of National Planning Commission, and he has the portfolio of energy, water resource, and uh, like these uh, sectors. So, we expect to hear from you, sir. The floor is yours. and i will i i kindly request you to limit your presentation if possible within 15 minutes thank you very much sir the floor is yours avela you know sir everybody i think is on board and uh, uh Uh, first of all i would like to congratulate the organizer for this webinar and specifically professor andrew baker from australia and uh, our ex minister i i had the opportunity to listen very briefly about uh, what he talk about and actually i <laughs> i am not fully aware of this actually because i had lot of other engagement but uh, basically what i th uh, think is this is related to clean energy mechanism and how we in nepal are working on this and how uh, we will be able to harness the technology that has been actually developed and evolved in australia germany and even china and other countries also in future so i think uh, I I could not hear much more from 
uh, our ex prime minister ex minister <laughs> uh, mr sa uh, i think he has highlighted some of the issues because he has been working for long time also particularly in this area i have briefly mentioned by uh, sunil uh, sunil ji or um, uh, that we will be talking in this webinar basically uh, to bring about uh, the experiences and new ideas on uh, clean energy system particularly hydro and small scale dam projects also and how the benefit of the dam project will be in the energy distribution mechanism energy supply mechanism and also uh, reducing the uh, the extent of flash floods which we are facing today so basically uh, we have uh, particularly in case of nepal we have a program uh, uh, 15th five year plan with long term vision and that actually explains about uh, the role of alternative energy including solar energy bio -ener uh, bio energy and uh, also form of energy of course is one of the most important area so we are working on that and uh, so far uh, you know uh, for the last uh, 100 years we are uh, in a very still in infancy i will say because uh, uh, we have uh, only uh, 1300 over 1300 megawatt of energy available mm -hmm. and with respect to other alternative energy mm -hmm. we have about uh, just over 55 megawatt of energy but our major emphasis is on uh, biogas sector which is uh, which has penetrated in large sector of rural community areas and now we are facing some of the problems also in bio biogas particularly the labor shortage uh, in the even in the rural areas also so new uh, way of working we are we are thinking that is uh, you know community based uh, you know biogas system which will be also supplied and uh, quite a few energy based bio energy system has been established within the country and it is uh, taking momentum but unfortunately because of the uh, this pandemic uh, you know covid uh, for the la from uh, over the past few, five six months now uh, the mobility of the technicians and other people into the village areas and to support and to provide technical assistance it has been very largely limited so this has also limited our implementation program so uh, that is the status here and also many of the uh, you know hydro related project although we are working but still because of this uh, you know pandemic impact uh, we are facing the impact because uh, sir sunil sir and things like that sunil na so our uh, basically the government uh, we have a uh, we have plan and policies particularly for uh, alternative energy promotion also uh, so that in future we will have uh, we have plan for solar energy also uh, over uh, 550 megawatt to be installed within the country in different uh, states so we have seen at least 50 megawatt of energy in each of the states uh, uh, based on solar solar power uh, initially that is what that is what is our plan here and particularly uh, many of the other uh, people have also say, might have said that we are we have given major drive in hydro energy sector and in hydro energy sector uh, so far we have large uh, Large, we are largely dependent on ROR system, and that actually, in the context of climate change and rising temperature in the Himalaya region, uh, in future I think uh, it will be little bit of a different scenario. So the government is planning to go on dam project also. So dam project, particularly, we have uh, some flagship uh, dam projects. Where, uh, uh, 
last year we have an agreement with a dam project of over 742 megawatt in Tamur River Basin, uh, a dam project. Similarly, there are other projects also which we are working. Uh, the famous one which we have been listening is uh, Budi Gondaki, which is still ongoing. And this year we were uh, uh, we were about to completely finish the uh, you know the uh, before the project commences all the necessary work, for example, land acquisition and EIA and other things also. But again, because of this uh, pandemic, we are a little bit late on this. And similarly, there are also other dam projects which are on, we are in the stage of planning and developing uh, feasibility assessment is already done and some GPR process processes are also gone, particularly in Dudkoshi uh, River Basin area. And these are relatively bigger projects. But uh, what I can see is, you know, now we can also actually, uh, private sector may be interested actually. And uh, even the developer may be interested, even in smaller project, dam projects also. Because this will have a tremendous impact, particularly the country like Nepal, which, where we, are, we have a very, very high degree of vulnerability in class floods and tremendous uh, you know, landslide, which we are now also facing. So this will uh, circumvent, at least some of the studies have suggested that uh, 16 to 20% of these uh, type of you know, catastrophic event are circumvented if uh, we have the, the dam projects also. So these are some of the uh, findings of the research. So basically what we are trying to do is, you know, energy is our major priority, particularly clean energy, hydro, and alternative energy, uh, solar, uh, solar and hydro mostly. And in case of rural area, bioenergy, which is uh, basically uh, used from bioresources. We all know uh, those who are in participating here. So these are our uh, major uh, uh, departure and policy thrust in Nepal, particularly for clean energy, because uh, uh, up to now also over uh, uh, 1 trillion, over 1 trillion rupees of our, you know, and equivalent of foreign currency is we, we are investing on purchasing petroleum products. So petroleum oil and diesel, petrol, all these things. So gradually our, uh, our uh, actually emphasis is gradually to go into the cleaner energy mechanism whereby our policy is also emphasizing on the use of uh, uh, electrical vehicles into the uh, in the roads. Similarly, kitchen gradually to replace the kitchen through energy, uh, you know, uh, clean energy, particularly hydro energy uh, in cooking. And at the same time, irrigation is also one of the major part in Nepal. And our policy has emphasized actually to gradually replace the. Uh, uh, carbon-based uh, fuel, which has been used in lifting uh, irrigate, uh, lifting water from underground gradually. So this, this is a major thrust that the present government is giving, particularly for the uh, augmentation and in, uh, enhancement of the clean energy mechanism into the country. Similarly, with respect to the, you know, surplus trade, because we have the capacity of, you know, feasible capacity of uh, over 42,000 megawatt of energy generation from hydropower and uh, quite a lot uh, from over, over 4,000 uh, megawatt from energy solar also. So any surplus energy, what we will do? We are also actually in close contact with the regional uh, energy trade mechanism whereby we are talking uh, with the uh, Indian government and at the same time, Bangladesh government. And for that reason, we have, uh, uh, we have the master plan, which has been already prepared, particularly on transmission line, actually to go from, uh, to access from Nepal to India and India to Nepal and Nepal to China and China to Nepal also. There are over seven points which are already been identified. And this way, uh, the infrastructure, energy infrastructure planning particularly in transmission line, which we have a master plan now, and we are working on that. 
And based on this, we have uh, this uh, 15 five year plan, which also emphasizes on this. Uh, and there are many other aspects, particularly how best we can supply uh, those energy and electrification throughout the country. Uh, we are uh, almost over 90% of the population now are electrified. It means that, you know, not, uh, uh, they, are, uh, they are getting light actually, where it is very, very remote area. There we have emphasized, our, uh, our policy emphasizes actually to go on alternative energy, particularly solar energy, even some, in some cases wind energy and small micro hydros, uh, micro hydro also. So these are some of the broader policy aspects that we have promulgated uh, by this government here. And the major emphasis and major beneficial and beautiful part of this is, you know, participatory. Mostly it is participatory, private sector and the community also. Communities are also taking part into uh, different aspects of benefit sharing mechanism resource use mechanism. This is inbuilt in the policy system. So these are some of the things that I would like to actually mention here on behalf of the government of Nepal and uh, National Planning Commission uh, at the federal level. Similarly, we have actually, you know, work on how much energy that uh, investment can be brought by local level. We have three tiers of uh, governance mechanism now uh, in the federated structure. We have the federal structure uh, in the, at the center, and then we have provincial, then we have the local level. Local level, they can uh, go as per their capacity, they can generate up to, uh, uh, up to three megawatt of energy sector, small, small scale in the local level area. And similarly, anything above three to 20 megawatts that the province will, uh, will be able to do. And similarly, uh, the, uh, the federal government, uh, they can go up to 200 megawatt and anything above, you know, the big mega projects, then it will be in a collaborative way with the federal government and the investor within the country and outside the country. So that way, actually, it is a, uh, it is a collaborative process. These policies are actually established and it will be run through, uh, the mega project will be run through a single window system whereby the investor will come and which uh, of course because of this COVID we are a little bit behind but uh, uh, but uh, you know when the COVID will come down gradually I think uh, our whole emphasis will go again so energy sector particularly clean energy sector and clean energy mechanism is one of our priority and already we are also exporting now uh, earlier we are net exporter, but now we are also ex uh, importing uh, from Nepal also, exporting from Nepal also to India. And it is a, another concept which we have brought is the uh, concept of energy banking, whereby during uh, rainy season, we have a lot of, uh, we can generate more uh, energy. And then that is one of the time when it is very, very heavily required in the tropical plain area of India, Bangladesh. Hello. Hello. So there is, there is another uh, mechanism also. This is also within our policy. So within, uh, if the COVID was not done, uh, not affected uh, this time, we would have uh, actually increased by about 1000 megawatt already. So these are some of the broader picture that I put the government is uh, government policy and how we are moving with participatory way, bringing community together, bringing investment together, Nepali investor, private sector, foreign investors. Mm -hmm. That way we are moving in different aspect of uh, energy investment and energy promotion. So these are some of the basic uh, ideas of the government. Uh, of course, there are uh, problems of uh, every, every, every project or every uh, policy actually has to face some of the problems. Basically, so, it's a democratic country, and then we have, uh, you know, we have to work with the people. Uh, one of the major area is, you know, preparedness. Uh, we are focusing on preparedness now, because one of the policy departure of the government of Nepal is establishment of project bank. Because in the project bank, any project which need to be implemented should be actually. Uh, 
be within the bank and that it means you know all the preparatory or work of the project has to be carried out before it is being implemented so that means uh, feasibility assessment land acquisition eia and then uh, dpr all this prepare and they will be stayed into the bank project bank and we will actually based on the priority the government will actually prioritize and bring into that that way i think in the coming years huh? once the project bank is fully operational and established then i think we will have less problem currently we have one of the biggest problem which we are facing is the land acquisition because many private lands and if you talk about the transmission line or even land acquisition for the project site for hydropower development even for the small small scale uh, mini hydro also there are some problems so these problems are gradually being solved and people are also accustomed now and uh, development agenda particularly energy development agenda and specifically clean energy agenda we have been giving priority by the government of nepal so these are some of the policy area that we are working uh, by the government of nepal uh, i will stop here uh, on this and as far as time allows i would like to listen more from uh, experts and particularly advice from professor andrew uh, from australia i think you are with canberra or uh, sydney university i am not sure i was also part, uh, part of a university i was a visiting professor in australia also uh, some time ago so i have visited uh, we started from university of darwin all the way to uh, queensland and then finally where <laughs> university Thank anyway you. thank you so i will much. stop here thank you very much yeah. and thank welcome you. you all and this is excellent uh, actually we can share these things in a broader way through webinar than bringing people together and it is cheap also relatively cheap also and we can actually share good knowledge from different uh, experts uh, by such uh, gatherings thank you very much for the organizers thank you thank you gunaraj ji thank you okay thank you thank, thank you, you sir, sir. Uh, for your for your remarks uh, so basically we hear uh, uh, policy about energy or energy policy in nepal so there are different forms of renewable energy uh, that have been promoted from the government sector but still renewable energy is not at mainstream it is still alternative energy so perhaps uh, we have to think of how we can bring modern renewables into the uh, mainstream energy of nepal and also we hear uh, something about uh, nepal no, no no it has been mainstream law also please don't get confused uh, because uh, alternative energy is also mainstream now you have to be very updated by law also and by you know program basically also guraji some noise is uh, there were some background noise so yeah, yeah. take care of it i just uh, so uh, nepal is is a uh, prone to natural calamities you know large hydro micro hydro perhaps there are uh, it is prone to calamities natural calamities uh, landslide earthquakes etc so they might need uh, a different source of renewable energy mixer into the national energy grid so that even in the worst condition there might be uh, some backup energy uh, available so uh, for that uh, situation as well solar uh, biomass hydro uh, sorry um, wind may play major role uh, to to uh, continuous supply of uh, energy in the country so these are the few things we hear from uh, dr oli so now uh, because we are very uh, very tight in our schedule so without any delay i would like to request uh, professor jagannath shrestha who is former director of center of energy studies institute of engineering trivandrum university uh, for your remarks uh, please limit uh, because we are already behind the schedule so i kindly request you to limit your uh, remarks within 5 6 minutes so now floor is yours professor shrestha okay um 
Thank you. Gunaji, Sunin sir. Sunin sir. Yeah. Thank you. Sabalai, uh, Namaskar. Thank you for all the speakers. And my special thanks to Professor Andrew Blackers for his very informative and motivating presentation. Uh, I have uh, nothing to add <laughs> in, the pre in his presentation, but to reinforce his presentation, I would like to show some of the works that we have done at the Institute of uh, Engineering, Krivun University. I will take around five minutes, okay? Let me share my screen. Uh, oh. Host, please uh, enable my uh, screen sharing. Okay, sir. Well, I disable Gaurav as a give only screen sharing. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I will do it. Okay. Yes, you, you can share, sir. Okay, so. I will go here. Okay. Dekhin sir screen? Hello? Yes, sir. Okay. It's, so, it's these are some of our uh, works that we have done uh, almost 20 years ago. Just to inform Professor Andrew Black. Screen the Kiba sign, sir. Kiba? Screen share, Waka sign, sir. Who said the Mercia Goreo? Action, eh? Ayo? Ayo, yes, ayo, sir. Okay. So these are some of the works that we have done uh, at the Institute of Engineering, Trivon University. So this uh, work will reinforce what Professor Andrew Blakers have already said. So we have a zero energy house called Model for Energy Conservation. And uh, just to add, to Professor Martin Green has been here in our campus in 2003. Uh, probably uh, Professor Blager knows him. Okay, so this is a Center for Energy Studies, also known as Zero Energy House. This is a living laboratory for the students uh, studying a Master of Science in Renewable Energy Engineering course. Okay, so we have here uh, pumping, microhydro, biogas, solar thermal, geothermal energy for air conditioning the house, energy storage, and using the uh, uh, biofuels, you know, the liquid, the fuels, the fuels from the seed, and also the biogas uh, for the cooking uh, purposes in this house. So this is a, generally the zero energy house. And this is particularly a, was a project of National Planning Commission some 20 years ago. Well, the, uh, as Professor Blacker said, Abdul, I do you, what, what pumping, what pumping from lower side to higher side, we have demonstrated it practically uh, to show to our students that what they should be doing in future. So this is very interesting uh, pro project that we have done. As you can see, you know, we have, we have, we have used the central centrifugal pumps and pumping the water from the pond to the reservoir. And we are producing around, this is a small micro hydro plant, three kilowatt, and so using the 10 uh, horsepower pumps. So this has been a very good e example of pumping from lower lake to upper, and this could be a good example at home. So these are the, some of the pumps. This is the you know, uh, pond from where we lift the water to the reservoir here and run it to my plant, and that goes on uh, continuously. 
And also we have, if you look at this building, this is an inverted roof. We tap the rainwater and take it to the pond. So this is a, a good, a good a recycling thing, see? And uh, uh, Professor uh, Andrew Blacker said about the rooftop, and we have done some uh, study in 2015. And in this studies, you know, um, in this study, uh, in Kathmandu, in Pokhara, in Biratnagar city, the average sunny area in the rooftop was found to be 15 square meters. And this is sufficient to generate one point, to generate around, let's say, uh, four kilowatt hour every day. And that will be sufficient for the 90% of the households in Kathmandu, Pokhara, and Biratnagar city. So this, uh, this uh, project is uh, going on and uh, Nepal Electricity Authority has approved uh, this kind of thing. So if you can install 500 watt and more on your rooftop, this can be connected to NEA National Grid. So this is a good example, yeah. So I have shown how much energy we can generate if we install 200 watt, 500 and so on. So the average if you install, 1,000 watt on the rooftop, we can generate 1,861 megawatt hour per day. So this could be a good example. And this supports the Professor Andrew Blacker's idea. And also, uh, this is a very interesting fact, you know. Uh, in 8th of May, 2016, Germany, generated 87% of the energy from renewable energy sources, solar, wind, biomass, all kinds of things. They achieved this practically. So in one of the slides, uh, uh, Professor Andrew Blacker said earlier that we can have 100% renewable energy by 2050. So based on German experiences, this can be achieved not only in Europe, but in the other parts of the world also. So I believe that 100% renewable energy can be achieved by maybe 2050. And the one thing that I would like to add is, in future, we might have a solar satellite power supply system. You know, the one drawback of the solar is insulation uh, time is very low, four hours, five hours. But if you go and install the, solar satellite power system at the geostationary orbit where you can have almost 24 hour solar insulation. And this energy by passive way, by active way, you can beam to any part of the earth. So this could be a future technology uh, later, okay? So having said that, you know, uh, we should be thankful to sun, which gives life, and thankful to water, which saves life and also thank the year which makes you alive and have and also thank the plant biomass help which gives food to live so having said that in briefly i have covered some of my ideas and i would like to uh, request uh, professor andrew blacker uh, that uh, we should discuss more in achieving the ideas that you have put forward and to implement it in Nepal in a practical way. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Sreshtra. Uh, thank you for your brief remarks. So uh, basically, uh, you mentioned we have also done similar kind of work, though in a small scale, but we have initiated some work in Nepal as well. So our university, university and other universities are also working in this area. So our universities are also uh, doing uh, research to the scale they can do, they can, and within the limitation of resource constraints and uh, perhaps uh, the uh, knowledge and expertise also we have limited. So even we, within that limitation, we are working quite well, but we need more, more collaboration and more uh, experience from uh, across the world. And one figure, I think we have, uh, the Germany figure is, I think roughly they have 40, 50, 40 around 40 to 50% electricity comes from renewable at the moment. So that I would like to 
point out one small figure. So now, yeah. without, without any delay, I would like to request uh, Dr. Narendra Cholagani, former Executive Director of Alternative Energy Promotion Center, for your remarks. Please kindly limit your uh, remarks within five minutes. We are already behind the schedule. Thank you for your interest. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, 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 the organizers, that uh, for the opportunity that uh, you provided me to, to speak today. Uh, uh, dear uh, KP Walisha, uh, Honorable Member National Planning Commission, uh, Mr. Ganesh Sa, uh, the former minister, which was uh, my minister when I was uh, at, at APC and also other speakers and uh, Professor Andrew Baker and uh, everyone participating today. Uh, there is not much also Jagannath sir, just uh, providing us the, the opportunity uh, also some, some, some uh, right, uh, right from the field, some field level experience also the data uh, from the renewable energy sector, including the zero energy house. So uh, KP Oli sir rightly uh, already uh, very, very well summarized how the government of Nepal is thinking and what the plan in the in the near and a bit in, in midterm future and also the professor uh, Andrew Breaker uh, rightly also very very well the technically elaborated uh, what is the good potential for Nepal uh, including the the renewable energy and and particularly focusing on solar so uh, please allow me just uh, briefly to go through, uh, there are some key issues uh, related to the renewable energy sector. So 100% renewable energy or renewable ener electricity that we have to distinguish. So for uh, like uh, also the difference between gigawatt and gigawatt hour. So sometimes we confuse that, okay, so many megawatts, but uh, it's not that uh, the megawatt we can use. We have to use megawatt hour. So the difference between uh, power and energy, so sometimes confusing. So, so that's the sometimes not always the uh, install capacity uh, gives the power for us to use for us in our daily life. So, 100% renewable electricity that is very much feasible for Nepal, and we are very close to to that. 100% renewable energy is quite challenging because of uh, uh, so many reasons. For example, the transport. Uh, still to get 100% electrification in the transport, we need to move, uh, we need to go a bit uh, too, too far away. So it's, it's still not in the near future. So air and surface transport and also the for passenger and freight transport. So, so there are there are lots of things can be done, but uh, even we cannot get the 100% uh, the renewable electricity uh, in, in the transport sector. Also the cooking, largely traditional biomass cooking, uh, that's also uh, even, even in, in, in coming decades also, uh, we cannot completely replace the biomass fuel uh, uh, by, by renewable energy sources uh, like uh, clean cooking uh, because of the reliability and also the security of supply and also the animal feeding. So the habit of the people of the economics applicability that's basically in the rural areas and also space heating in the hills and mountain and also for industrial processing and manufacturing so it's it's not that easy to to inject 100 percent renewable energy into these areas though electricity might be possible because we have uh, largely hydro and also complement, complemented by solar uh, so uh, the challenges for nepal's energy future so we don't want to go again the, these days of power cuts, no more power cuts again, no more blackouts. That is what we are thinking of. So, how to ensure energy security, reducing vulnerability to energy supply. So that's also a challenge we have. And energy for all, connecting 100% of the population to clean electric, electricity. So that also we we have to achieve. And also sustainable energy supply. It is not just supplying uh, clean uh, electricity, but also supplying reliably. Uh, so, so reliable and uh, the, the circuit supply of uh, renewable electricity is, is quite important. Uh, the reasons for 100% renewable electricity supply that uh, the climate change mitigation needs uh, 50 to 95% of reduction of the greenhouse gas emission by 2050. That's the IPCC statement. 
CO2 emission from fossil fuel use caused by far the largest share of uh, GHG emission, uh, nuclear energy no sustainable alternative, and carbon cap capture and storage last only for a few decades, that's accepted at all. So there are the issues that we have to move to 100% you know, electricity supply. That's the global figure. So uh, for 100% renewables for Nepal, uh, that's the renewable electricity will need storage. So 100% renewable electricity supply, solar and wind, wind supply uh, may con constitute up to 90% worldwide. Solar and wind energy are intermittent. A hundred percent renewable in, uh, energy systems need substantial storage. Diversification of energy resources are required. So politically, we have now uh, plural, pluralism in, in Nepal, but we, we are not at uh, uh, practicing pluralism in renewable energy development. And South Asia regional power trade, which uh, also Dr. Oli uh, rightly uh, pointed out, and also Professor Andrew as well. And we have to look big and go beyond Nepal's national uh, boundary in order to have the sustainable energy solution. Pump storage, pump hydro, and also the cascade hydropower. Uh, that's the good potential. And the many hydropower plants uh, yet to be built. So. Uh, before we build something wrong, also we have to think of not to not to uh, not to damage that good potential that the Nepal's uh, uh, the hydropower setting and uh, ge geography and the topography. Uh, Nepal's renewable energy, including hydropower, can act as a green battery uh, in the Indian subcontinent. So look at uh, the example of Norway. Uh, the Norwegian hydropower system allows seasonal storage in Europe and avoids massive losses. 15% of the annual production is stored in, in Norway. So the Norwegian hydro, uh, the storage hydro system can easily be converted to a huge pump storage system due to cascades of storage lakes. So uh, during the, like when uh, there is surplus power in the, in the grid, they just use the grid electricity to pump the hydro. And when there is a deficit in the grid and when the price is high and they just say, uh, like they run the hydropower plants and they generate electricity and they run, they sell in much higher price. That is how they are just doing very good business. So geographically, topographically, Nepal also situated in very good condition to act uh, Nepal's renewable energy to act as green battery for the in sub. Indian subcontinent, which we have to, we have to materialize. So, uh, like uh, we have to have the the, the combination of uh, all the uh, available renewable energy sources, not just one sources. So, in order to make sustainable, so so solar power, uh, maybe not not that uh, massively wind power, but uh, largely hydro power. So, hydro and solar complementing, and whatever possible, also bringing. Uh, bringing wind into it and the uh, hydro not uh, like in traditional matter traditional manner but uh, like storage hydro that's the that's that's how we can get the hundred percent renewable electricity and maybe also in the future a bit not hundred percent but uh, significantly more than what we we are currently uh, generating or consuming uh, renewable energy yeah. so that's it from my side and thank you very much Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chongla Gai. So, uh, thank you very much for your uh, remarks. So, 100% renewable or renewable electricity, you, you raise one small question. And 100% renewable could be not possible in all sectors, but I think 100% renewable is a target. And in Nepalese context as well, we are already more than 80% renewable, but traditional biomass, biomass is also renewable. So, uh, the key message of Andrew, uh, I think, we can go to 100% renewables, that's the target. So we could achieve 80%, 90%, that's better. So all biomass or other source of energy, we can replace by electricity. And the message is, I think, is renewable energy, not renewable electricity, but we'll come back to the Professor Andrew at the end of the session. Uh, now I would like to request Mr. Lasmon Himire, Assistant Director of Alternative Energy
Thank you, Sunil sir, for 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 me introducing me. So let me start my brief uh, comments. There is a time constraint. So for in this program, honorable K P Wali uh, from the National Planning Commission, our ex minister Ganesh sir, uh, Professor Jagannath sir, uh, Professor Andrew from ANU, and then other experts, and then our other prominent experts. So let me allow to briefly put my points based basically based on the Professor Andrew's presentation. So let me also highlight that we should we must be very clear on the 100% uh, are we talking about the 100% renewable energy or the uh, renewable electricity for the context of Nepal. So so we, we need to be very clear on that, those two aspects. I, if we talk about the renewable energy, then we can elaborate more on that topic. And if, you, if we talk about the renewable, renewable electricity, then we can have some sort of idea to confine it. And then the second one is, uh, Andrew also mentioned that the 100% renewable energy in the context of Nepal is also possible. But I think uh, if we are aiming in that way, we need to have massive work on the de demand side of the energy, renewable energy management. If you see like the load management uh, from the demand perspective, we can generate electricity in the daytime from the solar and then some time in the, from the wind and then we cannot get the electricity or energy from 24 hours. So we need to be have some work in the demand side management as well. At the same time, other, other experts also highlighted that we need to have some sort of energy storage system like if we directly connect it to the grid from the solar electric solar pv then it could be the somehow competitive with the cost but if we have a system with the battery storage then we have some experience that it could be the costier solution for the nepal and then there is also debate and then i have seen many like articles and the documents there is also debate is there the mega out scale hydropower are the renewables or not and so we need to be discuss on that as well i guess and then at the same time we need we for the context of nepal we we must include that the off-grid technologies that we are promoting at that is at the at this time alternative energy promotion we are promoting the uh, solar mini grids mini hydro and then some large scale biogas as well to the off to the remote and poor areas and some in some urban areas as well we are providing the electricity access to the poor and rural area people from the those isolated technologies. So we need to have some sort of inclusion of those off-grid technologies as well. And then also we need to include for the context of Nepal, if we talk about the renewable energy, we need to include the biomass and then biogas, which is more or less we have somehow competency in biogas technology as well. I believe that 100% renewable will energy or renewable electricity will also demand the investment in the complementary resources, like as I already mentioned from the, for the grid stability, and short duration of stories that we didn't have at today. And then I agree with uh, Professor Andrew's presentation that in the context of Nepal, we also, uh, come, our policies and plans are also focusing on the renewable energy. Uh, and then we are promoting on that way as well. And then it's to mitigate the climate change, we'll require the huge and the massive investment in the renewable not only reduce the fossil fuel generation, but actually in the context of Nepal, we do not have that much generation from the thermal or fossil fuel generation, but also we need to have work on from the other sector like the industry sector or the transportation sector. If we take the examples of, uh, examples of the transportation sector, then we need to work out for the uh, work out for the research and development and the massive deployment of electrical vehicles. At the same time, for example, we, we could have a higher price of electric vehicles so that we cannot implement at the massive scale to, at the competency level with the conventional vehicles. So there are some works that we need to work on to direct towards 100% renewable energy. So in conclusion, due to the time constraint, let me put my conclusion. This, we need to this two, we need to distinguish in the energy sector and the electric sector. Of course, there is a possibility of 100% renewable energy, but we need to have lots of we need to have lots of work 
in the policy formulation, like a policy formulation, research and development, and then the government initiatives with the support, financial incentives, all those, all those measures we need to take it. And then at last, I would, I would like to thank everybody from the on the behalf of APC for joining this event. And then I would like to thank, uh, provide my special thanks to the chairperson of the Recon for organizing and coordinating this event as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ghimire. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, as uh, you said, 100% uh, renewable is possible. Of course, there are lots of uh, groundwork is necessary, so there is no doubt. But at least is you, from the uh, from the authentic organization of the government, and we have also Dr. K.P. Oldi from National Planning Commission. So I think government sector will certainly look after uh, making it possible in future. Now, uh, I would like to request Mr. Novin Guzel, uh, who is former president of so Manufacturers Association Nepal. For your remarks, please uh, limit your remarks uh, as short as possible because we are quite behind the schedule. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Loni. I'll surely take care of the time uh, and try to limit myself uh, within the five minutes. Uh, Honorable Dr. K.P. Oli, respected uh, former minister, uh, Ganesha, uh, Professor Andrew Blair, and all the participants. Uh, namaste and uh, very good afternoon to you all. Uh, thank you, Professor Blakers, for your elaborate and fascinating presentation with in depth you know, analysis of uh, the various um, renewable energy technologies and uh, the possibilities of, you know, analysis of storage possibilities. Uh, we are, you know, we got to learn a lot uh, from your deliberations as a person involved in uh, the promotion of renewable energy, uh, specifically solar energy systems. I have been really delighted and enthused to hear, hear your uh, presentation. Um, I think we need to do this more often in the future too. So, so far as adopting these various, you know, technologies in Nepal is concerned. Uh, I totally agree with Dr. Uh, Professor Blakers. Uh, we also believe that the Nepalese state uh, needs to focus far more on mainstreaming the uh, uh, you know, renewable energy systems, uh, visualizing uh, mainly solar, wind, micro hydro, biomass, and those two with a you know, reasonable degree of storage in order, in order to usher energy mix which in turn will uh, help to boost our energy security. So uh, that we are <clears throat> with you on this. Uh, mind you, I did not include the large scale hydro uh, within the framework of uh, uh, renewable energy here, because you know, it is already the mainstream energy so, uh, you know, source in Nepal, rightly so. And uh, so, so when we talk about renewable energy, we mainly uh, you know, talk about solar, wind, or micro hydro and biomass. Okay, now, um, yeah, and then uh, we surely also need to, um, you know, first of all, yeah, there's a great deal of interest actually uh, lately uh, in the implementation of uh, especially solar power plants. I understand that, uh, you know, more than 300 uh, megawatt uh, peak of uh, projects have already gotten uh, uh, survey license. So uh, there's also considerable interest to promote uh, rooftop type systems, uh, but somehow there is some kind of, uh, you know, reluctance in the part of the policy makers to actually allow all these systems to, uh, to, to be developed. So uh, we have to somehow, uh, you know, um, uh, try to uh, cut this situation and, uh, and get a breakthrough so that all these initiatives are actually, uh, you know, dealt with properly. <clears throat> Now, uh, we surely also need to uh, gradually adapt the uh, energy storage to balance the consumption pattern during the day, as well as uh, to balance the seasonal variation of consumption of electricity uh, and also production of electricity. So uh, this will be really uh, instrumental in, in the optimization of our uh, grid system in the future. That surely has to be done. Uh, I heard, um, you know, quite interesting things about uh, uh, the pumped hydro uh, uh, systems uh, that um, you know, Professor Blakers talked about. Um, 
when I first heard about this, I was a little bit, uh, you know, concerned because uh, I thought that maybe it'll be a little bit complicated or, you know, uh, difficult in our scenario because all the Himalayan rivers, they flow from high mountain range and with a very high speed. And uh, they also bring al along with them a lot of, uh, you know, uh, uh, turbidity, debris like logs and rocks. So po to pump that water uh, upstream would be uh, difficult. That was my thinking. But uh, after hearing uh, him, uh, you know, about pumping water from a small lake on the downstream and uh, to the upper lake on the upstream, uh, I thought that could be also a very interesting idea. Um, now, uh, just uh, battery storage is uh, something that uh, we uh, would be quite uh, interested to know more about and the suitability of uh, such systems in our case. Uh, if we can provide uh, like, you know, credible solution, uh, I think we can, especially um, to address the evening, you know, high demand, like we have, you know, a high demand at about six o'clock to eight o'clock, what we call the uh, duck neck curve. Uh, in order to deal with this, I think the battery storage can do it. So although currently, very expensive with the uh, fast growing trend of uh, uh, reduction in the price of battery storage. I think this would be uh, quite, an, uh, quite an idea, you know. And uh, as a representative of the private sector, uh, RE business, I would like to mention that uh, you know, we we'll would be very interested and open to explore opportunities for cooperation in the field of uh, battery and storage. Uh, we are willing to invest our bit. And uh, if the right policies are brought up by the regulators, we will be very much willing to uh, look into this. Uh, and maybe we can also, uh, you know, start thinking about uh, some ideas. For example, each municipality uh, having certain degree of storage uh, to facilitate uh, storage nationwide. Uh, I was uh, hearing that uh, the optimum storage required would be uh, the storage capacity of a day's consumption. Uh, in Nepal, according to the latest NEA uh, annual report, the uh, consumption last year was in the range of 7,500 gigawatt hour, which translates to about uh, you know 20 gigawatt hour of um, energy per day. Uh, if we um, start. Uh... Novin, sir, think, uh, we are we are quite behind the schedule, so I would like to request you to cut down your. Uh, okay. So, uh, my idea was, you know, if uh, each and every uh, substation of NEA would have some degree of, uh, you know, storage, that'll be a very, uh, you know, good advantage to the region. Now, uh, if I may, uh, I was I was also interested to ask a small question to uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Blakers. Uh, in terms of uh, percentage, uh, how much energy is lost uh, or wasted? In the uh, Mr. Mr. Bujel, we are uh, quite behind the schedule and we would like to take a few questions because our... Uh, uh, yeah. uh, th thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Bujel, because uh, uh, we had overwhelming enthusiasm from participants because we had 120 uh, in the Zoom. Now it's still 95, 94 people are following. So they might have uh, questions to hear from Professor Andrew. So uh, thanking uh, to all speakers, presenters, remark, I mean, commentators, everyone. I would like to open the floor for a question answer. Uh, and we'll take a few questions. But uh, before that, when we talk about energy, uh, we don't have to miss, uh, uh, you know, gender in energy. So in today's program, I, on behalf of organizer, apologize that not having a, a female speaker in our panel, I mean, in our uh, webinar, so that I apologize. So first I would like to invite, because I can see her, Dr. Indira Sakya. So with 
apology from organizer side. I would like to invite Dr. Indira Sakyo for your uh, brief remarks or questions, queries to uh, Professor Blecker and other speakers, other, other keynote speakers and commentators. Uh, Dr. Indira Sakyo, if you are here. So I think, uh, yes, the... Dr. Sakyo, you would like to say something? Uh, okay, then uh, I'll check uh, some questions and I request Gururajji if there are any questions in the chat box, please yes. pass on to me or you can ask from your side as well. Yeah. You, so I, you I, get... I found, I mean, I saw one question in the chat box. Uh, what is the average life cycle of solar PV? And at the end of the life, it be recycled. I think this is... Uh, uh, quite uh, interesting question for researchers and our uh, industrial partner as well, industry people as well. So, so if you can share some uh, uh, some some experience on it, Professor Baker. Uh, recycling is simply not an issue. Um, a silicon solar cell panel is 95% or 90% um, aluminium frame and glass with a little bit of silicon, a little bit of metal. Um, it, it's going to be a very small component of the total recycling and waste stream in Nepal. Um, and it might, it, systems will develop to, to manage it. It's a non-issue. It's much more important to focus on the, on the big issues, is, which is how to get more uh, solar cells into Nepal as fast as possible to raise people's living standards. Thank you, Professor Blackbird. Uh, if there are any questions, uh, you can raise your hand or can also take it from the chat box. Um, can I ask you one question, Professor Blacker? Go ahead. Uh, you mentioned about the agri voltaics, yeah? Yeah. Due to shedding, uh, the agriculture yield will be reduced by 10%. That is what you said. Is it based on your experiment or just a theoretical value? Uh, no, there has been a, a lot of work in, on agri-Baltics around the world. And um, the, if, you, if you shave 30% of the crop, the amount of produce you get goes down from anywhere between a, a, an actual gain down to you know, 20 or 25% loss. And it depends on which crop. So it's a very simple matter to do a, a search on the internet to come up with hundreds of experimental studies of agri -voltaics. And you can apply them to whatever crops you have in Nepal. Thank you. We are interested in case of uh, paddy, you know, paddy. The main... Yeah, paddy will be, <laughs> a paddy is, um, paddy rice is one of the crops that actually suffers more loss the, um, than others. Uh, because it's not because it's not water constrained. It's sitting yes, in water. The um, the sort of crops that typically do well. The sort of crops that do well are crops that are um, that are water stressed. Okay. Thank you. Okay, uh, I'd just like to add a comment that um, I don't think I got through very clearly. Uh, silicon photovoltaics is, is the big one around the world. It is more than 50% of all new generation capacity is silicon photovoltaics. That's where the world is going because it is much cheaper than anything else. My strong advice is focus on the main gain, which is off the shelf, silicon photovoltaics. You don't have much wind in Nepal. Silicon PV is the way to go with, um, with pumped hydro uh, balancing of the grid. 
And for balancing of the grid, I strongly recommend not damming rivers. Go for off-river pumped hydro. It's a completely mature technology. You have vast numbers of places to put off-river off pumped hydro, and you can go to our global atlas and, and look at them. There's, there's hundreds or even thousands in Nepal, and you only need about four. Mm. So focus on the main game, which is silicon PV with um, pumped hydro balancing. Yeah. Yeah, so Everything else is just, just small, 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 small. Yeah, there'll be a bit of run of river hydro, there'll be a bit of biomass, there'll be a bit of this, a bit of that. Silicon PV is where the world's going. And I, I know that I come from Australia where we're installing every year more PV than uh, it would be required to supply all of Nepal's annual energy. Every year we do it. And we, we know a thing or two about it. And that's where the world's going. Yeah. So perhaps uh, that, uh, I mean, we are talking small scale, small, small, and all uh, different kind of energy you know, mixture is uh, due to the uh, nature, uh, geographical condition, social and technical capabilities. So that is one, on one side, but on the other side, we have to think of big scale, all renewables. We have to increase, enhance our growth GDP uh, our livelihood. So we need some sort of balance in between, I think. Uh, and there are some questions and I also have uh, one question in my mind. So as you are saying, solar is the only solution to enhance energy supply per capita. Also we can increase per capita solar in Nepal. Uh, Not the only, but the, by far the major. By far, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, by far, by far. I mean, the, the most important source we can say. But, uh, we import all solar PV from abroad. So it's still economically, because as you know, we are economically not very strong. Our country is not very strong. So what do you suggest? We, is it time to have solar manufacturing industries? Maybe we can bring sale and uh, do other processing in Nepal, or at least, I don't know. At what stage do you see? Nepal can start on doing its own its own solar industry in Nepal. I think you need to talk to India, which is reluctant to import vast amounts of solar from China. And uh, India and Nepal could work together to have at least some, uh, uh, you know, to have a fully um, integrated local solar PV industry. Nepal can't do it alone. It's too small. It's not an advanced manufacturing company, country. India and Nepal together can do something. Okay. Uh, thank you. I believe this process is already underway. There are a couple of companies considering uh, manufacturing solar PV modules here in Nepal by importing certain components like cells and things like that. Just for information, thank you. Okay, so so yeah, thank you, thank you, Mr. Buzel. So we can bring sale and then produce module and uh, other stops. So there is another question I can see because uh, our I mean there are also uh, some discussion going on hydrogen storage, transportation, uh, generation in Nepal. But uh, in your presentation, you already say it's by far expensive and it's not competitive to other storage technology, but still, uh, how do you see hydrogen generation storage and transportation is technically feasible and eco economically viable in Nepal? Is this technology sustainable in resource con constrained countries like Nepal? What do you suggest? Hydrogen is all about hype. Uh, there is the, the, the electric vehicle industry, the electric heating industry, the electric storage through batteries and pumped hydro is, is orders of magnitude bigger than hydrogen and will remain so because hydrogen is so woefully inefficient. It's so bad to throw away three quarters of your electricity and you want to get a quarter back. Whereas with, uh, sol uh, with pumped hydro and batteries, you, get, you only lose about 10 to 20% of your energy when it goes through a storage system. 
hydrogen has a future as a chemical precursor for plastics, ceramics, and jet fuel and things like that. It has a very small future as a storage medium and hydrogen vehicles are nowhere compared with electric vehicles. The future has already been decided for transport. It's electric vehicles, it's electric cars, it's electric buses, it's electric trucks. The hydrogen vehicle has lost. And you just got to look at the relative sizes of the electric transport industry versus the hydrogen transport industry to see that. The only place that hydrogen will have a chance will be ammonia for long distance shipping, electric short will, will win in short distance shipping, and um, perhaps synthetic jet fuel or even hydrogen for intercontinental air, aircraft, even uh, for short haul aircraft, electric aircraft will win. There is a very small market in transport for hydrogen. Don't get, don't get sidetracked into hydrogen. It's just not going to work for Nepal. You can't make hydrogen at a competitive price because your solar and your wind is so poor compared with a place like Australia or the Middle East or Western China or um, uh, the deserts of Chile or a, a you know, dozen other countries. You, you simply can't compete. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Professor Blaker. Uh, I think we are already far behind the schedule. Uh, I would like to uh, read out one of our participants' uh, comment. He said, uh, your presentation may give new dimension in solar energy policy makers and other stakeholders in the future. So I hope, uh, because we have an uh, uh, honorable member from uh, National Planning Commission, so he can influence the policy in national level. Also, uh, represented from Alternative Energy Promotion Center who are implementing the renewable energy issues in Nepal. So I think this uh, session, this uh, webinar can have uh, fruitful impact to our policymakers as well as private and other non-governmental sectors. And we as an university, of course, we have uh, wonderful experience uh, discussing among different uh, speakers. And I hope we can bring new collaboration uh, in research, implementation, development, together with the government, uh, in, uh, uh, universities from abroad, our universities among the Nepal, I mean, within the Nepal. So I hope this uh, webinar can have some fruitful outcome in days ahead. Uh, and if there are any pertinent questions, I, I ensure that we'll uh, list out the questions and we'll communicate via email after um, uh, getting the answers from our experts. So now, uh, request uh, Dr. Daniel Tulader to give a vote of thanks on behalf of organizer and conclude the, uh, the session or for the closing remarks of the session. Dr. Daniel Tulader. Thanks, Sunil, sir, uh, uh, for giving me an opportunity to give a vote of thanks to all the part It. So first of all, I'd like to thank our uh, speaker, uh, Professor Andrew Brackers, for your nice presentation and enlightenment in the field of renewable energy, as well as I'd like to thank our Ganesha uh, sir for your remarks, uh, Professor Jagannath Yester, Naren Cholagai, Dr. Dosman Prasad Kimiri, Mr. Novin Uzil, as well as I'd like to thank Mr. Gunaraj Takal for organizing such a uh, webinar. And in the behalf of our Department of Mechanical Engineering, Kathmandu University, I'd like to thank all the participants. And if there is any question in this regard, you may mail to this organizer and also we can view a lot of comment in this regard. So saying these few words, I'd like to thank you all, organizer and everyone, a participant, and see you all in this COVID situation we are seeing in the virtual way. In future, we'll meet again in the real world 
Thank you very much. Thank you, Lonisa. And thank you all. I'd like to conclude in this way. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Lonisa, is there anything? No, yes, it's, it's, all, it's all okay. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Blacker. Thank you, Dr. Wally, all participants. Thank you, Buddha. Thank you. Special thanks to Sir Lohani sir. Thank you, Dr. Wally. Thank you, Andrew, Blackers. And thank you all for the very nice program. And we are committed to supply the report presentation. Yes,